Many of you have been asking for a photocentric Apple Silicon review and benchmark. I have some time to do a lot of those testing and I'd like to share the result and my analysis with you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Let's get started. I'm Art and Art is Right. Before we start, subscribe if you're new and hit on the bell icon so you'll be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. The conversation here is going to focus on many of the photo application running on Apple Silicon compared to its Intel counterparts. If you'd like to see another aspect of the Apple Silicon review, such as display connection, how many display you can connect natively, the refresh rate, any issues you may run into with calibration, so on and so forth, I'll leave a link to my previous two Apple Silicon review in the description below and also up here so you can check them out. Let's talk about the application that I will go over in this video. It is really difficult for me to cover all of the applications that are out there. I know there are many plugins, there are many more applications. These are the ones that I use in the workflow and they're ones that I'm familiar with so I can give you a better assessment of how they perform. The way how these are gonna run is going to give you a really good idea of how these perform in the other programs as well, especially if programs have been optimized to run natively on Apple Silicon. Programs we're gonna look at is Lightroom Classic. So if you use that in a desktop environment, we're gonna cover that. I know that I have already covered some aspect of Lightroom Classic already, but there are some twists that I haven't actually gone over yet. And I think you'll find the result very interesting. I'm also going to cover Lightroom CC as well. This is the cloud version of the Creative Cloud app. And recently Adobe have just released an update version 4.1 that will run natively on Apple Silicon now. So there are some odds and ends there that I have been finding out. I want to share that with you. We're going to talk about Capture One. And the reason why I want to focus on Capture One is because many of you guys are using Capture One and Capture One runs differently in Lightroom where Capture One uses and utilize a lot of GPU power where Lightroom is more CPU and RAM intensive. So that's going to be an interesting look at the differences between the two. And lastly, what we're going to do is look at Photoshop and how it handles small files. And if you're the type of user who do large composite in Photoshop, you're going to find a result very interesting as well. Now let's have a look at my test system. So for these, I'm using the three same system that I've used before. My 2019 Mac Pro, which has 12 cores, 3.3 Xenon, 96 gigabytes of memory. It has the upgraded video card, the Pro one, Radeon Pro Vega 2 with 32 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory 2, 2 terabyte SSD. I have my 16 inch MacBook Pro, it's from the year 2019, eight cores, 2.4 gigahertz, so that's the top of the line one, 32 gigabytes of memory, and the video card have been upgraded to AMD Radeon Pro 5500M with eight gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. Those are really all a mouthful. And with the Apple Silicon M1, this is pretty much the upgraded system with eight cores, GPU and CPU, and it has a 16 gigabytes of unified memory. This video, we're not going to talk about display connections, calibrations, and also bit depth. For those of you who are wondering, it can output 10 bit. I have tested this already. And for all those things regarding display calibrations and display connection, um, the frame rate that it runs at, I don't have any updates on that right now. As soon as I get information from the different, I would say manufacturers about how can that issue be resolved? I will share them with you in a video that I will publish on this channel. All right, that being said, let's jump into the benchmark. So there's a few key here I wanna share with you before we jump into this full conversation is that if you look at a title for each slide, this will tell you if, for instance, if this is a previous test that I have already done and share with you, or if it's a new test. So if a title has a blue in there, you will see that it is a past test. This is something that I have done in the previous benchmarking video. If it's actually in red, then it is a new test, a brand new test that I'm doing for this video. So even though this is a photo test, the first thing I want to do is kind of share with you briefly my Final Cut Pro compressor benchmark. This is a previous test that I have done. So one of my followers have made a comment on this and made me really think about how can we really test this out to see if, you know, if the programs are really utilizing fully Apple Silicon already. And when it's doing the video compression, is it really dipping into the, you know, hardcore uh, compression engine or not? So what I have done there, and this is something that, you know, we kind of have a conversation about is to enable these apps that are running universal to run on Rosetta. And there is a way to do that. So if you highlight an app, you press command I on the keyboard, you will get this information panel that comes up. On this information panel, you can check that box that says, open using Rosetta, and this is going to force the program to run in Rosetta. So that's kind of interesting there. 
So in our conversation, I have done a further testing on this and what I found out is with compressor, you can't really do the command I and make it run on Rosetta. So I have to go back and resort to Final Cut Pro 10.5 and this is doing a 4K export from within the program sharing for Apple devices. The original source is a 4K 8-bit 422 Panasonic S1 and this is also being exported to a 4K so shorter bar is better. And what we're seeing, the results very similar to what we've seen before where the Mac Mini really just edge out, for example, the 16-inch MacBook Pro that costs, I would say, two times as much, if not like two and a half times. And it comes really close to a Mac Pro that costs around eight times as much. The interesting thing about this, though, is that with the Mac Mini result, you can see there in a the purple bar, it's running natively versus the one that is running on Rosetta 2 you will see that there's almost no difference at all. So what this is telling us is that these type of encoding that uses the GPU to help out with the encoding and everything is already dipping into the GPU cores on the M1 itself. This is going to build the foundation for, for what we're gonna talk about next with regards to Lightroom as well. Let's talk about Lightroom Classic first. I have done a lot of testing on this. These are all the previous tests that, that I've gone through, the one-to-one -one preview the Lightroom Classic export, the one-to-one -one preview for 1,000 files. And as I mentioned in my previous video that with 1,000 files, we're starting to see anomaly where, for example, halfway through the Mac Mini performance dropped by about 20% or so, and it took much longer for it to finish. So you can see that it doesn't really scale up quite well just yet. So these are my new tests that I have done. First, what we're gonna look is how long it takes to do an HDR merge on the two Intel Mac and compare that to the M1. So what I have done here is take nine Nikon D810 files. These are 36 megapixel raw files. Those are the base files you see there on the left. And on the right is the final image composed together, fully edited. So let's see how long it takes. So I've done two types of testing on here. One of them is the preview time from the moment I right click on those group of files and say merge to HDR. How long does that take for it to generate a preview for me? And then afterwards is the merging time, the moment I click on merge, how long did that take for it to merge the file? And for the deghosting, I have this set to none. The auto align is on and the auto setting or the auto adjustment is turned off for these images when I was running these tests. So the preview time for both Mac Pro and the MacBook Pro, it takes about a minute or so, less than a minute. For the Mac Mini, it took a little bit longer, about a minute and 20 seconds. When we merge these together, Again, less than about a minute for a Mac Pro and the 16 inch MacBook Pro. For the M1 processor, it take a little bit like about a minute and 10 seconds or so. Nothing really surprising here. It seems to make a lot of sense. This is still running on Rosetta. I'm really curious how much better it would run when it can do it natively. But let's continue on with more punishing tests. So this is a HDR Panorama 190 megapixel merge. And the reason why it is an HDR is because all those 10 files that you see there on the very top, those are all HDR images. So instead of being the normal NEF raw file that is about 40, I would say like 40, 45 megapixel or so from a DA10, these are generally on average about 120 megabytes and they are DNG file. These are 32 bit HDR that has been composed together or have been merged together in Lightroom already. And afterwards, I've taken all these individual HDR files and merged this into a panorama that the end result is 190 megapixel file. And these are in the gigabytes already for the actual file itself. Let's take a look at the result. So the preview time, you know, it's able to generate the preview for most of these really close to each other within about like, I would say 20 seconds or so is able to do a panorama preview for me. So for the panorama, there's no adjustment being done. What I have done is do the, pull the slider where it kind of fill out the boundaries to full to 100% so everything gets stretched out properly. So for these panorama mergers, the Mac Pro took about a minute and six seconds. MacBook Pro minute and 23 seconds. Those are pretty good there. They're within range of each other. The Mac Mini though, running on Rosetta did took double the amount of time, two minute and 15 seconds. So if you have to kind of put this together, if you're running on Lightroom Classic, it's okay. It's not too bad. It just takes double the amount of time, but I don't think it's crazy or absurd or anything like that yet. Let's continue on with another panorama merge that is more of a normal panorama, but this is using a lot of pictures. This is 14 Nikon DA10 files, so 1436 megapixel file merged together to create a 314 megapixel file. And again, these files, the one that you see below there is the edit image. So let's take a look at the result. 
Because this is a largest dish, the computer did take a little bit longer, like 10 seconds longer. So it was able to show me a preview in about 30 something seconds. So those are not bad at all. And again, between all those three machines that were in line. However, again, we're seeing the merge time um, as we've seen before, where the Mac Pro is the fastest, about a minute and two seconds. MacBook Pro was at one minute and 17 seconds, and the Mac Mini did took longer at two minute and 22 seconds. So in the next test, I'm using these same images and I'm running it on Lightroom CC. With Lightroom CC, there's a few things that I want to mention. Adobe have just released a new version, 4.1, that runs native on Apple Silicon. So I have installed 4.1 right away. The thing is this, when I try to revert back and install version four on Rosetta and force it to run there, it won't run on the Apple Silicon anymore. It bounce a few times and then it just doesn't launch. This is the same thing if I run version 4.1 and I go command I on the icon and ask it to run or open in Rosetta. Again, it doesn't work. So obviously I can't really do a lot of testing there before and after, but we can kind of see the result after compared to, um, you know, the Intel counterparts. A few interesting notes is that even though this version is supposed to be compatible and run natively on Apple Silicon. We still get that warning, say you're installing a Intel based version of Lightroom. So using the same files that I use for Lightroom Classic, let's see how Lightroom CC version 4.1 perform in HDR merge. We can see there that on the native Intel version for both Mac Pro and MacBook Pro, it took over two minutes to generate the preview while running natively on Apple Silicon, Mac mini took a little bit over a minute. So half the time that it takes the Intel counterpart to run. And I'm not 100% sure why Lightroom CC takes much longer to generate the preview than, for example, Lightroom Classic. This is pretty much a double the time of Lightroom Classic, which I find very interesting there. The other thing too is the merger time is something that we've seen before between the two Intel versions that the MacBook Pro is faster. But what I think is interesting is that the Mac mini really just take the crown on this one where it took a little bit over 40 seconds where all the other ones took 20 seconds longer. Now let's have a look at Lightroom CC version 4.1 HDR panorama merge into 190 megapixel files. And the reason why you're hearing a voiceover for this portion is because in the testing, we have ran through a lot of anomalies, including some anomalies that has been happening and occurring on the 16 inch MacBook Pro while we're running Lightroom CC version 4.1. Again, also when we're running these testing on like with Lightroom CC 4.1 on the Mac mini, the result is also highly inconsistent where one test we're able to get a decent result and a decent amount of time. Other tests, it ended up taking a very long time to do merger. So let's have a look at the result here. To generate the preview on all of these computers are pretty fast. They take about 20 seconds or a little bit over 20 seconds or so, not too shocking. However, if you look at the result for the merger time, this is where things start to become interesting. For example, the Mac Pro to merge all these files together takes one minute and 12 seconds. The MacBook Pro take one minute and 18 seconds, while the Mac mini actually took nine minutes and 52 seconds. And this was pretty much the fastest test run that we were able to produce. There were some times that the Mac mini took 16 minutes. There are other times where the Mac mini um, just really took more than 17 minutes to which at that point we just canceled the test because there was just too much going on. Here's another merger group of 14 images, Nikon DA10. Again, same group as it was before. Let's take a look at the result. About 20 seconds to generate the preview on all of the machines. Mac mini taking slightly longer, but not too much longer at all. And when we merged all these files together, the Mac Pro was able to do it in less than a minute. The MacBook Pro was able to do it in one minute and 12 seconds, while on the Mac mini M1, it took nine minutes and 51 seconds to run this test. And again, we have run multiple tests on this. This is the fastest result that we're able to achieve on this one. So just something to keep in mind there that Lightroom CC 4.1, even though it is running native on Mac mini at this point is still not optimized in all the aspect of the program as of yet. One more thing that I want to do is a export test of 100 D850 raw files to full JPEG sRGB size. So shorter is better, obviously. Um, this is even faster than a Lightroom Classic on the export, just slightly faster. So the Mac Pro took a minute and 49 seconds. 
MacBook Pro version 4 takes 2 minutes and 55 seconds. And again, 4.1 takes longer uh, on the MacBook Pro at 3 minutes and 14 seconds, while the Mac Mini, it's 3 minutes and 7 seconds there. So not really quite edging it out yet. Um, this is really one process where it pushes the core and using the memory on the system fairly intensively. Now let's talk about Capture One. What's interesting about Capture One is that it really pushes the GPU, the graphic processing unit, more so than Lightroom would ever do. If you run Capture One, you will know that it really pushes those GPU hard, where the CPU and the memory, well, not so much. It does utilize it, but not quite the extent it utilizes the GPU for image processing and rendering and everything. So one thing that I want to note in the beginning of this video that I've shared with you the Final Cut export result using both native and running on Rosetta, that is also using a lot of the GPU capability of it and is already dipping into the hardcore um, GPU encoding engine itself. So I'm not sure if Capture One is going to be the same or not and how much more optimization can be done. This is something to be seen. But just from the results so far, the M1 did take longer than the Mac Pro and MacBook Pro. While honestly, the MacBook Pro edged out the Mac Pro by a little bit there, so it's fairly interesting. But on the exporting of files though, and these by the way are the same 100 files that I've used in the other tests before. They're from a Nikon DA50. This is exporting JPEG to full size there. So you can kind of see the result that on the Mac Pro, it took about a minute and 57 seconds. On the MacBook Pro, however, because it has a less powerful graphic card with less memory, we're taking about four minutes and 47 seconds. And on the Mac Mini, it's taking eight minutes and 15 seconds. Again, this is without any type of optimization. It's still running on Rosetta 2. So I'd be curious to see how much Capture One improved running on just the M1 processor in general. And there's one more chart here that I'd like to share with you. And this is pretty much the export comparison between three programs, Lightroom Classic, Lightroom CC, and Capture One. We can see right here that Mac Mini M1 is really nudging close to these other Intel counterparts. And just something to think about too, as I mentioned before, it costs anywhere between half to an eight time less than a Mac Pro. And also the power consumption is a lot less too. So it's really giving these processors a run for the money, not to mention that for at least the two of them, Lightroom Classic and Capture One, these are running on Rosetta, where Lightroom CC is supposed to be running on native now, but we're not seeing that much of an improvement in export time. The fastest program that you can use to export these files right now is Lightroom CC. Amazingly enough, as you can see in the chart there, I wish a Lightroom Classic was more optimized like that. That would be cool. And with Capture One in general, on the Mac Mini M1, as we've seen before, the using the GPU for export is taking longer, almost double the amount of time that it takes the MacBook Pro to just do the exporting. So that's just something interesting to note there about Capture One. So now let's talk about Photoshop, which is the pinnacle image editing program or the pinnacle pixel manipulation program to do any type of creative work. To run these tests, rather than doing the testing on my own, timing at my phone or my watch, which can not be as accurate because it's based on human reaction and I'm not the fastest, you know, reaction wise. What I have done is look at this website called Max Performance Guide. It's created by Lloyd Chamber. He goes by um, Dick Lloyd as well, which is short for Digital Lloyd. And he has a lot of really great insight in optimizing your machine. I will put a link to his website and also the script that I'm using to run these tests in the description below too, so you can check that out and see what these tests does exactly. But let's take a look at his speed test first. So running these speed tests, um, it's pretty much just test how fast the system can go through, uh, you know, small files with all these processes essentially. And these are times in the seconds. So what we're looking there is around seven seconds, close to like eight seconds on a Mac Pro. MacBook Pro took longer. Mac Mini running on Rosetta took about the same amount of time. But here's the thing. Adobe has Photoshop beta version that's supposed to be running natively on Apple Silicon already out. And I ran a test on that too. And you can see there that it pretty much half the amount of time that it takes to run this test right now. So regarding speed, it is pretty fast comparing to his Intel counterpart. Another thing too, my testing I found out is I've tested two different RAM configurations. So I tested with the 70% RAM and a 90% RAM. We can see there that on the Intel Mac, the Mac Pro and the MacBook Pro, there's almost no change in time at all when we bump up the RAM. And this is because the memory architecture for these Intel machines are kind of the older one where the memory sits somewhere and the processor have to make a call to the memory. The memory has to load the data in from the SSD or you know NVMe running on the system first. Something interesting that's happening on 
the M1 processor because of its unified memory architect is that the moment we bump that up, you can see that running on Rosetta, it took literally almost two seconds off the time, so it's faster. Although when we run it on the native version, Photoshop beta, we see that the time barely changed at all. Those differences in milliseconds are pretty much literally just margin of error. So we can see there that increasing the memory does help, but when it runs native, it may not do much. Another thing that I've done too is done his medium testing. So these, what this does, it generate a 15.7 gigabyte file and it runs through all of his things, adding noise and doing all these actions. We can see something interesting there. So the moment we start to throw large files at the Apple Silicon, it is starting to struggle a little bit as we're gonna see here. So the Mac Pro does it better, almost seven seconds. The MacBook Pro, eight seconds. Mac Mini running on Photoshop using Rosetta took 20 seconds to complete the task at 70%. And again, running it on the Photoshop beta took about close to 15 seconds or so, so faster. But again, what's interesting is that the moment we bump up the RAM by just 20% from 70 to 90, we see right then and there that the time literally is much faster, like seven seconds faster on the Mac Mini running on Rosetta. And then also on the Photoshop beta version, which is running native, we're pretty much cutting out about like a little bit over two seconds there. So kind of interesting. This is also telling us that the unified memory architecture is really making a big difference in terms of how the program can access the memory and how it can access the memory much faster than it was before, which is contributing to these lower timings that you're seeing on these charts right now. The last test I have done is using his Photoshop huge test, which creates a 56 gigabyte file. These are really large files here. And you can kind of see that for this one, the Intel Mac as of now still is, you know, supreme. So the Mac Pro is able to finish this task in about like 23 seconds or so. The MacBook Pro took about 93 seconds. So that's literally over a minute. The Rosetta M2 took 231 seconds. That's a long amount of time. It took almost like four minutes there to get things done. Uh, a little bit over four minutes actually. And then the Mac mini running on Photoshop beta right now is still taking, um, I would say close a little bit over three minutes to get things done. So it's not quite as fast as where we want it to be yet, especially if you're throwing large files at it. So here are my final thoughts on this. If you are a photographer and you need a production machine today, the Intel iMac are going to be the best value as of now. If you have the money and you want to spring out into it, you can get the Mac Pro. If you can wait, the best thing that you can do right now is just to wait until all these software optimized run natively on the system, number one. And secondly, when Apple released the next gen or the iterative upgrade to this M1 Apple Silicon, I think it's gonna be much better and they're much geared for the pro type of use. The other thing too is that on these machines, there's not a lot of IO ports at the moment. These are really great more for a consumer machine that can do some type of pro work. I mean, if you do video, if you don't need calibration, these are great machines that will blow the Intel one out of water. But if you are doing photography work or anything like this, it's not really just quite there yet. If you need to plug in a lot of drives, well, not quite the machine that you really want to look for at the moment. A few things I want to kind of just mention as well is that this is a platform change on the processor architecture going from x86 on Intel to ARM. Not only that, we also compound this with a major OS architect change going from a 10 dot something, for example, 10.15 in Catalina to Big Sur, which is version 11. These are big jump with a lot of architectural changes on the back end. We're going to run into some of the issues. Considering that Apple was able to make this transition this smooth, it's just really fantastic. To be honest with you, I think this is an even smoother transition than moving from their PowerPC to Intel back in 2006. And there's a lot more machines that are available on day one as well, which is, you know, really quite amazing. Something that I want to give you too is perspective wise to always think about this, that every time we jump from a major OS version, for example, Mojave 10.14 to Catalina 10.15, we run into problem with the software. This is the same thing we're running to right now. But again, we also have an architecture change on top. The best thing that I can recommend for you right now is to exercise patience. If something doesn't work right now, it's not a matter of if it's going to get fixed, it's just a matter of when. I know, for instance, um, plugging in some 4K displays over USB Type-C or Thunderbolt, you're only able to get a native refresh rate of 30 Hertz. That can be frustrating. You want it to be faster because everything lacks and is slow. 
I totally understand. I know the engineers are looking at it right now. And as soon as there is a solution, I will share them with you on my channel. But it's just a matter of when those solutions are going to come out. These machines are literally out on the market for less than four weeks as of this filming. I mean, they're super new for majority of the people that are involved in this whole process. There's a lot of changes. And lastly, what I will say is this. These are fantastic machine. Considering that this Mac Mini costs way less than the other two machines that I own, half of the MacBook Pro and eight times less than my Mac Pro. And considering it can perform this well and use this amount of power, this is just really showing you how great Apple engineering is. And it really gives us a precursor for what's coming next. But for now, if you do pro work, especially if you're a photographer, just hold off from the time being. That's going to be the best thing that you can do. Anyway, I hope that you find this comprehensive benchmarking for photography helpful. If you have any questions about this, leave in the comment section below. Give this video a like, subscribe if you're new, hit on the bell to be notified every time I upload cool new videos like this. And until next time, I just write.